out of CES 2025. And the second thing we are going to get are these new Intel motherboards. This is the ASUS Tough BA60M Plus Wi-Fi, the Z890's younger and non-overclockable motherboard. While AMD has X870 and now B850 and B840, Intel now has Z890, H810 and this B860. I hope I don't end up saying the wrong chipset because both AMD and Intel are now on the same 8th gen chipset. This is going to get really confusing. Anyway, this is my first tough MATX board I have seen in a long time. So what do we have inside the box? Of course, we have the motherboard and this usual suspects, a pair of SATA cables, stickers, ASUS web storage, a quick start guide, and M.2 rubber pads for your SSD. And surprisingly, there's no extra M.2 Q latch, but you will get the classic M.2 standoff and screw. Tough boards in general are known for two things. Number one, they are more budget friendly compared to the Strix and of course the ROG lineup. And two, they feature more military design than the very colorful and LED splashed premium boards. You can see that it is all black, like a Pro Art motherboard, with only the top icons and branding on the IO area, the PCH, and a few areas on the board. For a non overclockable board, this Tough V760 features a nice height for the VR heatsink and a grill-like design to remove whatever heat that may be gathered around the CPU area. The real I.O. area in comparison is more bare and simple with a heat shield on top of the chokes linking it back to the I.O. area. There are no Thunderbolt 5 or 4 ports on this V860 but you will get one Type-C 20GB port, one USB 2, four USB 5GB ports and two USB 10GB ports. Compared to the previous V760M Plus Wi-Fi, you get one more 5GB port in lieu of a USB 2. I guess this is a win. Other ports include a HDMI NDP to allow you to use the onboard graphics on Core Ultra CPUs. You also have a 2.5GB LAN port, the pair of attachments for your Easy Wi-Fi 7 antenna, and a more standard audio ports. Someone did mention that you may face an issue trying to have 5.1 surround sound on the ZN90 boards because of the number of audio ports. But I think there should not be this issue on this motherboard. The I.O. ports on the front are also pretty standard. There's one Type-C 10GB port, one USB 5GB, and surprisingly, only one USB 2 port. I guess that this is only so much you can do with a B860 chipset and the size of this board. Well, because most of the lanes go to the PCIe and storage areas. This B860 board gives you one Gen 5 x 16 PCIe slot here with the shield, and one more Gen 4 at the bottom. However, this is an X4 slot. And as for the storage, there are three M.2 slots and four SATA ports. The top M.2 slot is a Gen 5 X4, the bottom two are Gen 4 X4. These slots may not look as much compared to a full-size B860 or even a Z90, but I think it is now for a gamer or a mid-range user who simply does not want a full-size PC on their desk. Oh, I forgot to mention about memory or RAM. There are four slots here, which allows you to put up to 192 gigs of RAM. That's four times 48 gig RAM sticks. Speeds go up to 1800 mega transfers per second, and they also work for CUD RAM sticks. Just to clarify, you will not be able to overclock your CPU, but you still can overclock your RAM using Intel XNP. And as for the other essential features on a good to know basis, we start off with the two 8-pin power headers here, followed by a non-standard location for the Q diagnostic LEDs. They tend to be on the top right, but ASUS has now moved it to a new place. I don't think there will be a difference, cause you may already know what do the different colors represent. Where the diagnostic LEDs once were, now lies AIO pump header together with the CPU fan and fan optional on the left. There are three ARGB Gen 2 headers on this board, but no RGB. The 24-pin header to power the board is here. There's one Thunderbolt 4 header, three fan headers, and the front panel and front audio headers are here and here. Just a side note, with all three fan headers at the bottom, make sure that your fan leads are long enough to reach the bottom. But with an MATX board of this size, I don't think it will be an issue. And lastly, the CMOS battery is located at a nice position next to the M.2 slots, which makes it easy to remove and put it back in. Okay, let's put some components on this board. The Intel 285K, 32GB of KingBank DDR5, 
one terabyte WD SN850X and this big Cooler Master MA824 Stealth 30th Anniversary Edition. Okay, looks like I have to update the ME Intel Management Engine Driver. Okay, I will figure this out later. Anyway, before we go on to performance, let's go through what's new inside this tough BIOS. The easy mode interface looks pretty similar. You can tune your set with easy tuning and you can view the essential info like CPU speed, RAM speed and your CPU fan speeds. You are also able to turn on XMP and go to the QFAN control on this page. There's also the ASUS Q dashboard here, which gives you a nice heat map of what you have on your PC. This is useful especially when you have multiple SSDs or USB devices plugged into your PC and you want to know where they are on the board. It even tells you that you have disabled or enabled XMP for your RAM. But the main thing that's missing from this BIOS is the ability to overclock your CPU. I don't see any way to tune your CPU by changing settings such as the current like those that you see on PVO or Precision Boost Overdrive. The advanced mode is also very similar to the Z90 boards. You are able to choose between the default Intel settings or the ASUS Advanced OC Profile for higher performance. You are also able to turn on XMP for your RAM and I've gone with XMP1 over here. The other options are also similar. You can change the Thunderbolt configuration here and this is the refresh QFAN control page. It's pretty interesting that the BIOS automatically selects PWM when it detects a PWM fan such as the one on the cooler and it seems like you can't choose between PWM or DC if you have a PWM fan. I have to test this when I can find a DC fan. Okay, this is pretty much it for the BIOS. Let's go on to performance. Alright, I ran Cinebench 2024 and V-Ray to compare between Z90 and V860. There's like a difference of a few hundred points for V-Ray, but I say it is within the margin of error between these two chipsets. Likewise, the multi-core scores between the two chipsets also seem similar, but I am surprised that there's a slightly better score on this V860. I think this may be due to the performance patches that Intel has put across recently. The test results for the Z90 were taken slightly after the launch of Z90 and the Core Ultra 285K, so it is nice to see an improvement for these new motherboards. This may make the Core Ultra CPUs more enticing if you are interested in these new CPUs. And as for gaming, if you are wondering where is my graphic card, here we go. This is the RTX 4080. I am not exactly a fan of this new Q-release level. It doesn't feel as good as the previous Q-release switches on ASUS boards. Or maybe I am not sure how to use this well. I guess you can just install the GPU as per normal. And when you want to release the graphics card, you push the lever down and pull the graphics card out. But it just feels a lot harder to push the lever down and pull out this big graphics card. But that said, the card does feel snug on this board. So don't worry about that. Gotta run it a few more times to see how this level actually works. Gameplay performance is also pretty similar between the BA60 and ZA90. I know Cyberpunk 2077 may not be the best to show that, but you can see that the game ran at an average of 180 plus FPS on 1080p high without ray tracing and DLSS. Cyberpunk is a very GPU focused game, but it's nice to see that the CPU, a very powerful 285K, puts out really high FPS when giving it more focus. I don't have the prices yet, but I think this board or any other BA60 boards in general should be more affordable than Z90. The Tough Gaming Z90 Plus Wi-Fi currently goes for Singapore 5 to 9, the Prime Z90M Plus Wi-Fi, Singapore 460, and the Tough B760M Plus Wi-Fi, 378 Singapore dollars. So if this board lies in the Singapore 400 range, it should be in a good spot. Okay, so this is not meant to be a full review, but well, I think it's almost one. Intel's 15th Gen, or better known as Core Ultra, is definitely better after the recent patches. Actually, it is slightly better, but I think it does feel more stable. And as for this B860M Plus, yes, you will not be able to overclock your CPUs on this board, but you'll get the same creation and gaming performance compared to the Z90. If you are a mid-range user and want a smaller size board, you can opt for this B860M+. There's enough PCI slots and also enough storage via the M.2 slots and SATA ports. The dual Thunderbolt 5 ports on full-size Z90 boards may seem pretty interesting and appealing, but I think most mid-range users like gamers do not actually use these ports. So if you want to give these new Intel CPUs a chance and probably save a few tens or even hundred bucks, give this B860M Plus a look. Let me know in the comments if you're going to do so or are already using a 15th gen CPU. You. Like if you like this video, watch my review of this Z90-A and catch you in the next video.